standing along the banks of the Sea of Galilee, organizing their fishing gear, pre preparing their nets to go fishing again after completing a day on the water, two sets of brothers dropped what they were doing to follow an unknown rabbi who told them he would make them fishers of men. We know these men had a profession. Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John, were not seeking out a new vocation or way of life. As Jesus moved along the shoreline, the two groups of brothers may not have even noticed Jesus before he approached them, offering them the chance to upend their lives and the lives of their families. The four disciples acted immediately. The gospel writer does not tell us why the disciples acted without haste. We have received very little of this backstory. You know, this is one of the moments, one of those moments when I wish we had just a sentence or two more so that we might have a better understanding of why these four disciples and the coming eight were so compelled to stop, in this case, drop their nets and follow Jesus. The disciples were not offered a prophetic mantle. Instead, Jesus commanded their attention. It seems that as my kids are getting older, the instructions for assembling their toys are becoming more and more complicated. As a former engineer, I'm a pro when it comes to assembling IKEA furniture. I have faith that the illustration-only instructions provided by IKEA can guide me through building a dresser, a desk, or a chair. And I love step-by-step -step instructions, schematic drawings, and how-to manuals. As a teenager, I loved reading the Haynes Manual for my 1994 Dodge Spirit and later my 2001 Chevy Camaro. Step by step, piece by piece, a good set of instructions can guide us to the desired outcome in almost any situation. Any project is less burdensome, less intimidating with a good set of instructions, something to follow without ambiguity and even a few pictures. As Jesus called his disciples, he told them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men and women, fishers of people. We don't have an account of Jesus telling Simon, Peter, and Andrew, or James and John how this would happen. He did not give them a guide to consider before they walked away from their old lives to begin a period of what we in the church call discipleship. The four men left their nets, their boats, and they followed Jesus. He gave them very simple instructions. The men and women who had joined them in this journey had no idea where this journey would lead them. A journey that would seemingly end on a Roman cross, but ultimately culminate on Easter in an empty grave. Those who first followed Jesus may not have expected the miracles and signs they would see, but still they followed. Discipleship means to follow Christ. It means to become an ambassador for the kingdom of God. The invitation to follow shows that God has chosen to not work alone. Jesus is not interested in the intellectual. He didn't ask, does my teaching make sense? Instead, he commanded the vocational, follow me. Discipleship can take many forms. At Mount Olivet, we have identified key areas that we feel are critical to being answered when considering Jesus' invitation to follow him. Worship, being part of a community of grace, spiritual and Christ-like practices, and service and generosity. No matter where you are or how long you've been following Jesus, we believe that these four areas, identified and guided by scripture are how we begin to respond to Jesus's invitation to follow. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Every day we place our hope in one another to get through the day, live as a community, and care for one another. And yet Jesus tells us, and we see in his ministry, that to follow him means our hope must rest in him and nowhere else. This may sound lofty or churchy of me to say, but when we proclaim Jesus Christ to be Lord, placing our whole trust in his grace, 
we are saying that the ways of the world, those who ask for our allegiance of fidelity, must take a back seat because we have been called by the one in whom God chose to redeem the world. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. In and through him, God reconciled the world. When we choose the ways of this world over the ways of God, the faithfulness of Christ stands. The hope of Christ remains. When our love for one another, when our love for God fails, the love of Christ stands. In Christ, the kingdom of God was at hand, inaugurated by his life, death, and resurrection. The invitation given to his first disciples is an invitation to us to be part of the kingdom-building work that began on the banks of the Jordan River and in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus gave a simple instruction. Follow me. Two words without much explanation, and yet those words have set the course for the church for generation upon generation to do one of two things. Christians usually get it right or get it wrong. When we get it right, when we drop our nets, reorienting our lives to follow Jesus, miraculous things occur. The hungry are fed. The lost are found. Healing begins as divisions are cast aside. Our focus moves towards God and away from others who ask us to follow them. Jesus gave a simple instruction, but when the church gets that instruction wrong, the results are anything but miraculous or a sign of the kingdom of God being at hand. What we get wrong is thinking that the kingdom of God has anything to do with our actions. The church has proven this time and time again that we cannot follow the simplest of instructions to follow. To follow Jesus as he fed the hungry on the side of a hill. To follow Jesus as he stood beside a woman at a well. To follow Jesus as he healed the sick and invited the marginalized into his kingdom as the honored guests. To follow Jesus' call to put our weapons down. To follow Jesus is to follow the hope of the world, not to try and storm a castle or secure our own rights or make anything great. To follow Jesus is to live in the kingdom of God that is present now and work alongside other disciples as we await the fulfillment of Christ's kingdom. I do wish the gospel writers had given us more than follow me. Part of being a disciple is to ask questions. The first disciples certainly had their fair share of questions. To follow Jesus is to not have everything figured out. Rather, to follow Jesus Christ is to have faith Faith that in Jesus, the fullness of God has been revealed. When we realize this, seeing the hope present in Christ, we are able to follow, not our own agenda, we're able to follow Christ and proclaim the arrival of the kingdom of God here and now. Swiss theologian Karl Barth wrote, The command of Jesus is issued with all the freedom and sovereignty of grace against which there can be no legitimate actions of which no one is worthy, for which there can be no preparation, which none can elect, and in the face of which there can be no qualification. United Methodist Bishop Will Willimon reminds us that following Jesus Christ, discipleship, is the way God rescues us from vain attempts to make something of our life by giving you a job that's more important than you. Faced with a broken world, creation gone awry, God doesn't send the Marines. God casts forth the meek, foolish, and weak. God calls us. Even with our limitations, we, the church, the gathered collection of Christ's body are God's way of turning the world upside down so that God can put things right side up. The kingdom where the instruction manual is simple. 
I mean, not as many pictures as I would prefer. And the outcome is assured to us because no matter how many times we get it wrong, skip ahead or lose track of what we're supposed to do, the invitation remains. Follow me. Follow Christ. Follow hope. I offer it to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.